Dumbledore, what's going on? What's wrong? Oh, Professor Dumbledore, whatever that kind of a name is, wants us to report on our gifts. But I don't know my gift. Our gifts? Yeah, you know, like our spiritual gifts. Oh, you mean like the ability to mind read? No, like the ones that God gives us. You mean like breathing? No. Christmas presents? No. What do you mean? Like the gifts God gives us that makes us really good at stuff. Oh, you're really good at belching, is that what you mean? No. Oh, you mean because all the girls like you. No. I guess I don't care either. Maybe we should pay more attention when class starts. Well, welcome to the last class as we're dealing with our Gift Ed series. And as I begin, I want us to step back and remember, maybe you've had children or you remember being a child, and you remember the gifts that you get. Well, one of the beauties about children and in their immaturity is their capacity to take a gift and turn it into something you never thought they could do with it, right? I can remember years ago when my daughter had a gift of these little markers and she loved playing with them. And one day, my, her, my, her mom's gone, I'm at home, and it's a dad problem, right? So I'm hanging out with my daughter and I had to do something. I was working on some things and I came out to find that she'd been in her bedroom and I opened the door and there she is sitting on her floor covered all up and down her arms, all over her face with the markers. And I'm thinking, what did you do? Those are for coloring on, you know, the, the paper. Thank you for not coloring on the walls, but do you want to be a tattoo artist or something? What is going on? I thought it was the funniest thing. Took pictures of it and everything else. Uh, Another time, one of my sons uh, was given some cars. You know, those are Hot Wheels. Cars are awesome. Drive them on the ground, roll them around. No, when you take off one of your sons by your older son, they wind up being projectiles thrown at a very high speed straight into the forehead. Yes, he still has the dent today, my oldest son does. And it's one of those situations where you're just like, How, what in the world? Kids are fascinating with their maturity at turning your gift into something it's never been intended to. And I think God thinks that way about us. He gives us these gifts, and to be quite honest, we in our immaturity have taken them and misused them in all kinds of ways. In fact, as we get into the Bible, you're going to see just that idea. We've been talking about the gifts, and we've been looking primarily in this book here called 1 Corinthians. Now, if you've got a Bible, you're going to grab it. We're going to go into 1 Corinthians 13 today. But in this text, what's interesting is this church in Corinth, ancient Greece, it was just um, on kind of in the middle, right, by the oceans where it kind of, or the sea where it kind of was on an isthmus. What you have is this place where people are, are having the gifts of God work, and they're totally misusing them. They're using them to divide the church. They're using them for pride and arrogance, to, to puff themselves up. They're using them to envy one another, and, oh, I want that gift, and I don't have that gift, and you can't have that gift, or the complete disorder and chaos is breaking out, so the people are not giving their life to Christ. And Paul is going, what are you people doing? You need to stop it. And we could look back and say to those people over 2,000, you know, a little under 2,000 years ago, oh, you people are so immature. We got it all fit together. No, we're just as messed up. Spiritual gifts divide up denominations. Spiritual gifts are misused to create pride and healers and teachers and all these kinds of things and point away from Jesus. There's envy in the church as well. There's all kinds of disorder and, and spiritual abuse because of these spiritual gifts. And God looks at this mess and I think he goes, that's not what I intended them for. What are you guys doing? And so he gave us this text, gave us this section of 1 Corinthians to correct us. This entire series has been about one thing, and that is that we don't want to just go to church. We want to be the church. And the best way to be the church is to use your gifts, right? Those gifts that God has given us, we found out in the first one, where they're to promote Jesus as Lord. That's 101. No, what, what are the gifts then? They were clearly these gifts that the Spirit does through us, beyond us, and for the church. And we saw that there are miraculous gifts, we saw that there are word gifts, we saw there are service gifts, and we looked through all of these things. And now we want to know how do we use these gifts rightly. And so that's exactly what God gives us in this section of 1 Corinthians 13. He says, hey, this is how I want you to use those gifts. I have given you the gifts so you can be the church, but you need to have the right way with the gifts. You need to have the right way to use the gifts. Hey, if we want to be the church, then we need to use the gifts rightly. We need to let love guide the gifts. And that's our point. We want to be the church by letting love guide the gifts. And this is the point. We got to engage with love because otherwise, 
the gifts get all over the place. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, if you want to look up one verse, it'll say, Paul's saying, I'm going to show you a more excellent way, that this way of love is actually the way that we're supposed to use the gifts. And so we're going to talk about them as guiding the use of our gifts. And he starts off with this simple thought, that gifts are worthless without love. Without love, the gifts are absolutely worthless. And so we want to engage and see that. Notice what he says. He says, if I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have and I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. This is crazy. I mean, stop and think about it. How does lacking love um, make our spiritual gifts, God working through us into nothing, nothing, absolutely worthless, that you can have the most prophetic powers. They're not worth anything if you don't use them in love. How does that happen except by the simple fact that God gave us a gift that He wanted to be used in a certain way? God gives us the gift like a father gives a son the chance to go to a university. And the son instead uses that university time and that university being paid for, not to go get an education, but to flunk out, party around, and do whatever he can to mess up his life. That's not what the father intended. Just as God gave us these gifts, He didn't intend us to use them any differently than He would, and He always intended those gifts to be used in the way that He is, which is in love. God is love, the Scripture says, and so we are to use these gifts in love. We're supposed to let love be the guide to our gifts. Now, that means we need to define love, right? Because what do we mean by love? Do I mean all romantic, you know? Oh, it's so wonderful. This is so beautiful. It's love. We're talking about love. No, that's like a Twinkie, man. Our definition of love is like a Twinkie, all soft and fluffy with a gooey center. It's kind of like, Ugh, if you look at it. But maybe you love them. You're like, oh, they're good for a minute, but they have no value. They were worthless. They don't give you anything except a lot of chubbiness, right? And so we don't want to be like thinking that's what love is because love in the Bible it's like a hearty meal, man. It's going to be something that keeps you going. It sustains you. It's like a four-course meal. It's something that gives you all that you need for life. It's a way of living. And that's the point. When we talk about love here, we're not talking about fluttery feelings and gooey centers. No, we're talking about a hearty, hardcore way of life. And that way of life is what's going to guide our gifts. You see, when we talk about love, it's defined in this way. Love is being unfair to yourself for the good of others. Unfair to yourself for the good of others. And what do I mean by that? It means that love is going to cost you. It's going to be unfair to you. you. You want to marry that girl. Well, you're going to have to be unfair to yourself. You're going to have to give up your whole life and your whole self to that person so that you get married to them. You've given your whole self. You want to show love to your children, man, it's going to cost you. You want to show love to your friend, it's going to cost you. It's going to cost time. It's going to make you unfair to yourself. There's always a sacrifice. And it's going to be for their good. It's for their betterment, for their transformation. No wonder Jesus is the one who defined this gift this way. He said this way, Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. This is the greatest form of love. There's no greater love than somebody who's willing to lay down his life for those he cares for and loves. If you're willing to lay down your life, to be so sacrificial, to be unfair to yourself, man, then you see transformation. I think one of the most modern day parables that reveals this way of life is if you've ever watched the movie, It's a Wonderful Life. You may love it, you may hate it, you may be like, I've seen it a thousand times. The beautiful thing about George Bailey in that is that he constantly has to say no to himself for the sake of helping out other people. He was going to go on his honeymoon. He stops and he says no to himself, even to his own pleasures on honeymoon and travel, only to stay in Bedford Falls and care about the people of Bedford Falls, that ultimately he's a transformative figure in Bedford Falls, though he can't see that his love is powerful. And it takes an act of God to wake him up to that reality. And, and that's what I love about that picture. Other than Jesus clearly loving us by dying on the cross, which is the greatest picture, George Bailey shows us some practical ways maybe that would look. And so we see that love is a way of life. It's a way to be unfair to yourself for the good of others so that there could be a transformation. This applies to our gifts. 
God has given you and me gifts, not for us, not for our focus, not for our own things. If we did that, they're worthless. You could speak with gongs and all, you know, all that stuff, right? You'd have the most incredible powers worthless because here's the thing. It is that we're to be the church and let love guide the gifts. Then you're the church. So let's take a look at what this love really looks like. And we're going to examine is this next, cha- next section of the chapter, we're going to see this term love is. And this idea of love is, is going to show us the way of love. And so Paul is laying this out. He's going to say, hey, this is what love is. And maybe you've heard this before. You've been at weddings. You've heard this stated. Maybe you're going to have a wedding. You want it, you know, spoken. Let me just say, awesome. But this is not a wedding text. In fact, there's nothing about weddings or marriages in the context right around this. This is a way of love in the church as we use our gifts. And so what we see is, this is for all of you who are single, as well as married, old and young, widowed and otherwise. You don't stop looking at this passage when you're done getting married. It's not just for the wedding day. No, it is a way of life. And so we're going to step back. We're going to look at this and examine these things as we use our gifts. And so we begin in verse 4. It says, Love is patient, and love is kind. It does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, endures all things. This is amazing um, information. This is an amazing set of just attributes and, and calling to our life that we need to take in. Do you sense that? What we have here is honestly all the different ways love shows itself. And we can't just go through them one at a time. I'm, I'm going to kind of break them down a little bit into some categories because they, they kind of do join together. Like the first one helps us understand that we need to use our spiritual gifts with goodness toward other people. We need to use our spiritual gifts with goodness towards other people. That's what verse 4 is showing us. Look at that verse again. Love is patient and kind. Patient means to be long-suffering. It means to to be able to wait with someone for a very, very long time and not get ticked off, not get angry, not get exasperated and like, oh my gosh. We know patient people. They can go a long, long time with very irritating and difficult circumstances. And love is patient. It's so unfair to itself. It's so unfair to the person that they're willing to even go through pain and suffering on your behalf. This happens with our gifts. This shows up when in the word gifts, it's when a preacher is preaching and he's not getting mad because the congregation's not changing. He's not getting mad, but he's patient, trusting God. The word of God will do its job and change a person, right? It's not like somebody who has the miraculous gifts and he's praying and expecting God. He needs to act right now, immediately. Heal that person now, God. What are you waiting for? That would be ridiculous. Or perhaps really where it shows up the most is in the service gifts. You're feeling impatient. You're starting to get irritated because you have the gift of mercy and you've been caring for someone. And it's just taking a long time for them to get it. It's taking them a long time to figure it out. It's taking them a long time and you just can't go back and do it again. We need to have patience when we use our gifts because it's loving. It's going to take a while and we need to be kind with our gifts. And note this, kind does not mean nice. Nice is just is, is a, is like a, a thin veneer of paint over a person. You can say very nice things and be lying to them. You can be very nice to people, but you're not being kind. You can lie nicely, but kindness is something completely different. This is acting to help someone for their best. This is going out of your way to lift someone up and care for them. And look, you're not being kind if you go out of your way and you're a jerk to them. And so clearly this has a sense that we're doing things for people and we're being, you know, kind in them. So, let me put it this way. When you tell the truth, sometimes that truth hurts. It isn't kind to skate around the truth and be passive and ignore what they need to hear. That's nice, but it's not kind. But it's also not kind to tell them the truth in such a manner that you destroy them because they're evil. No, that's not kind either. That's cruel. And what we see is that kindness is actually the ability to deliver the truth 
in love. And this is how Paul talks about it. After speaking about the gifts in the church, he says, rather speaking the truth in love, we're going to grow up in every way into Him who is the head into Christ. And so when we're kind, we speak truth and love. When we're kind, we do truth. We live out truth. We live out these good things in this lovingness, in this kind of ability to lift the other person up and not destroy them. And so this is the key. You see, we need to remember, you got to sometimes say hard things, but we say it in a kind way. And so that fits in the back there in the Proverbs, right, where it says, faithful are the wounds of a friend but profuse are the kisses of an enemy. And so we get that, hey, when we're being kind, when love is kind, our spiritual gifts are going to come out kindly. And that doesn't mean that we're going to always say nice things. It's not going to be always felt like we're being nice, but we're going to be kind. And so when you get a word of knowledge, you may need to deliver that information you've learned about them in a way that wakes them up and you're being kind to them. But don't ignore it because that's not being kind either. Maybe you've received some kind of discernment that something's wrong, you need to be kind in how you deliver that, not just crucify them because you think that their teaching and thing is wrong. Ah, you're a evil, false teacher. Ah, no. We also need to realize that when we're doing our service, if you're an administrator and you're administering, you may have to tell somebody to step off of a, a particular volunteer team because they're just not doing a good job, but you do it kindly. And it's a kindness to them to help them step off to do something different, but it's a kindness to them also that you're opening a new zone of training. Again, we can't be afraid to be kind, and this is part of love and to use our gifts. And so, again, when we look at this, we want to do it with goodness towards the other person. It's going to look in that sense of patience and kindness, and then there's some ways that we shouldn't act, right? It goes into several now, and they all center on being self-focused. You see, you need to use your spiritual gifts, and I need to use my spiritual gifts without a self focus. We can get so easily in our culture be so self-focused, you know, my self-esteem is down and da-da. No, no, you're going to see that love doesn't have this self-focus. This kind of love is, again, unfair to itself and very other focused. And so when we get into this, these misuses we're going to see are often because we are so fixated on ourselves. It goes on in verse 4 that he goes, love is patient and kind, but it also does not envy or boast and is not arrogant. Now, envy and boasting and arrogance are all about a self-focus. When I'm envious, what happens is I'm so fixated on what I don't have and you have that I get jealous. Maybe it shows up in me in a way to actually be like, oh, I'm so glad they failed this time at their, at their worship time. Or, oh, I'm so glad that they, they did this. Or when they start doing something great, we get so mad because, man, their teaching is better than mine. And that, no, that's envy. And that isn't love. It actually calls you to despise the other person, not lift the other person up, not for their good. And so we need to realize that there are situations where many of us have looked at people with gifts, maybe on a worship team, maybe in a pulpit, maybe even in in leadership, and we go, oh, why can't I have that spiritual gift? I don't like the one I got. That's envy. And it's a self-focus. Use the gift God gave you. Trust He's going to use you and enable you. Don't get mad and, and whiny and upset that you don't have the gifts everybody else does. He already told us not all are going to be prophets or apostles. Not all are going to be teachers or any of these other things. No, He says, here's the more excellent way. Don't be envious and jealous. Use your gift in kindness and patience. Let love guide the gift. In fact, don't even use it to boast. Like one of the problems is boasting is when you're so focused on yourself, you're, you're seeing the value of your gifts so much, you want everybody else to see the value of your gifts. So you're running around telling everybody, hey, check this out. Look what I can do. Now, very few people are going to come across that way. But maybe you fall into the habit that some of us preachers have, and we walk up to people that we value and we go, so how'd you think that went? Now we're looking for the compliment. Not necessarily a boasting, and it has shown up in that pride, but there's other ways it shows up too. I've met people who've come to our church, they walked up and said, this is my gift, and they'll tell me, so I need to be on this, uh, leading this team. And I'm like, thanks, I don't know you from Adam, and uh, no. We don't just get to come in and boast about our gift. Let that gift be discovered. Let someone else point out the gift in you, and then it will begin to develop. But too often, we can get ourselves into this braggadocious kind of situation. And the funny thing is, this wasn't your gift in the first place. God gave you the gift. I don't know if you've ever played the game, I'm going on a trip. And so what happens, I'm going on a trip and I'm going to take 
an umbrella and you tell somebody else what you're doing. And it's like the last letter is going to be this or something like that. And so people, one other person knows the answer to the code you've put together. And it goes long enough as other people trying to figure out how to play the game and whether they're going on the trip with you or not, that suddenly they're like, this other person who was given the answer gets all cocky. Like, come on, people, you can't figure this out. What's your problem? I, I know what the answer is. It's so easy. No, it's not. You are given the gift. Just because you think you're great at something doesn't mean that it's you. It's God working through you. Give God the praise, boast on His Spirit and His presence, not on what you're doing. It's what the Spirit does through you, beyond you, for the church. And so calm it down a bit and realize, hey, if you think your gift is so amazing, then use it. Don't talk about it. Don't push it. But wait, does that mean we shouldn't listen to the testimonies? Those are different. The testimonies, again, are simply an opportunity to encourage you guys to find out what your gifts are and see that God does use the gifts. We even asked them to boast. We asked them questions so they could share with you. And we see their gifts, so we're inviting you to see them as well. That is different. And so I want to encourage you guys in this because we don't want to get so self-focused that we boast or that we become arrogant. And arrogance is simply the situation where we're still focused on us and the value and all the stuff that we, we kind of walk around and we gift project. Oh, I've got this amazing gift. You should have this amazing gift too. What's your problem? And I've seen this. You know, people who have the gift of tongues assume that everybody should have the gift of tongues. There are people out there who have the gift of, of teaching and they think everybody should know the Bible like I know the Bible. You're not accounting for your gift. Gift projection is one of those things like, well, I am so merciful. Why isn't he merciful? My pastor should be merciful or that person should be. Don't project your gift. There's an arrogance about that. Allow other people to have their gift. Celebrate their gift. And let them use their gifts and see what their gifts are. But don't go running around thinking, because I got this gift, everybody should. I'm amazing. Because you'll either wind up in that gift projection or a diva. Now, if you're in the worship world, the diva is that person who comes in thinking they're so amazing. Everybody should be doing their things for them. And that's not the case. Again, this is God's gift to you. He wants us to use it in humility. He wants us to use it in putting other people first. So let's, when we use our gifts, keep ourselves focused on others. Keep our focus on God. So if somebody gives you a compliment, what do you say? Well, Jesus says this when he gets into it. He goes, um, so you also, when you've done all that you were commanded by the, by the leader in his parable, which would be God, he says, we're unworthy servants. We've only done our duty. This is so critical to know that when God gives you a gift, there's something that you just should be doing. It's a simple duty. And just go, you know what? I was just doing what God asked me to do. Hey, thanks for noticing. I love to just say, hey, I appreciate that. Thank you. And in my heart, I tell God, thank you for using me. Some people go, hey, praise God, praise God. You know, I just, and they sincerely mean it. However you receive a compliment when somebody compliments you, look, it's important that it's not just deflection and you're not digging for it, but it's, it's genuine that you just appreciate it and you and it should grow into your worship on the weekend. This kind of help and this kind of love in our lives guides our gifts away from self-focus. And it can move us away from a focus, not just on being about ourselves, but ultimately being about our wants, our desires. Our own desires get focused in here. Notice how it continues on. Love is not rude. It does not insist on its own way, and it's not resentful, right? So these are all these kind of focuses on our own ways and desires. Rudeness, in the Greek here, was any form of shaming the other person to get them to do what you wanted them to do. So you'd come up and you'd be like, well, you don't you know I'm the pastor? Don't you know I have this spiritual gift? Or don't you know I helped you? You use your mercy gift. And now you expect something from it. And so you're suddenly shaming them publicly or in a way that makes them feel uncomfortable. In fact, this is the number of ways spiritual abuse has occurred. Very powerful leaders have used this situation, and it's weird because this word rude in the Greek has sexual overtones. It has a tendency to mean that you use your power, your spiritual power, to gain favors by shaming people or controlling them. This is a sexual harassment clause in the scriptures. Love's not, love doesn't sexually harass people or control people through the use of the Spirit of God and His power to get what you want. It's not going to shame other people and it's not going to sit there and insist on its own way and demand things. If you think a spiritual gift gives you a power over somebody else, you're going to be using it way out of bounds and you're not being the church. The church is when we use our gifts 
as they're guided by love. And what we have to see here is that that means we can't be demanding that I expect you to hear what I said because the Word of God came to me and I need to tell you what to do. Or, hey, it's a, mira- it's a miracle and that means you need to give me something back because I, I, I healed you. Well, you need to give to my ministry, 995 for every month or the rest of your life. No. It doesn't mean that we use our gift of giving and walk up and say, well, I'm going to give this gift, but you have to use it this way or I'm not going to give that gift. That's not a gift. That's not the gift of giving. And what we see then is that what happens here is we're not trusting God in the gifts. We're trusting ourselves. We're not trusting what God's going to bring about. We're trusting what we are going to bring about. And we want to control and command and demand what we want and our desires. And that is not loving. That is the opposite of the direction God gave the gifts for. It's about His church promoting Christ as Lord, not promoting us and our desires. And so let's watch it when we use our gifts, not to use them self-focused in a self-focused manner, but also not to use them in a way to get our own desires. And finally, we don't want to use them in such a way that the gifts kind of we're so focused on us, we, we get irritable and resentful, right? And that's what his bottom point is. We don't want to be irritable or resentful. An irritated person or a resentful person is somebody who's not getting what they want, so it gets in their way. They're kind of demanding already, or they're easily irritated, and then when that happens enough times, they're resentful. They, they keep no record of wrong. That's the idea. And these people are just so ticked. And so angry, you're like, hey, I healed you. Hey, I prayed for you. And you don't care about me anymore? There's there's a hook on it. There's always something behind it. There's always something that's annoying them. Maybe they're sitting there and they're just irritated that someone's speaking in a tongue around them. And they're just like, I can't stand this. Stop doing that. I don't understand what you mean. Don't you know you're supposed to do that in your own? No, stop. Don't be so irritated by everybody's gifts. Nobody prays around here the way I want them to pray. Nobody wants to, nobody wants to worship in the songs I like. You know, okay, time out. Our spiritual gifts are not supposed to produce irritation. Our spiritual gifts are not to, to enable us to be more irritated. I mean, can you imagine a pastor who's preaching and because people aren't doing things, all he's doing is get more irritated? It's something I have to work on sometimes. <laughs> But the point is simple. We don't want it to be irritable, and we don't want it to become a long list of things that we're holding on to and we're angry about. Rather, we need to be patient and forgiving. We need to be a people who understand that not everybody is mature, not everybody's growing. We need to be able to be mature ourselves and not allow that to become sinful. We don't want to be resentful of what other people are doing. And when they use their gift wrong, we're like, yeah, I got you. You did that wrong five times. I'm just done with you. You know what? Let's be gracious. Let's back up. Let's understand that God's grace and forgiveness and kindness enables us to make mistakes as we use our gifts and not be upset and not be irritated and resentful. This allows us some some movement and some peace with each other. I want to encourage us to be there in that, to have that peace. Now, finally then, we end up with this last section where he says, it does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. And so love is about the truth. When we use our gifts, it's about the truth. Hey, when we use the spiritual gifts, God's going to give knowledge to some people about the spiritual wrongs of other people. And we don't rejoice that, ha, that person failed. We don't rejoice that, ha, that guy got, con- that guy got convicted of his sin. Yeah, no, that's horrible. In the sense that the sin is horrible. We can rejoice in the truth that they give their life to Christ. We don't want to rejoice in their past. We don't want to get all titillated when bad things happen to people and get all excited about it. We don't want to focus on these kinds of things. Our gifts are to be used not to help people focus on all the bad of the world. Our gifts are to be used in such a way that we're rejoicing with God's truth of the salvation that comes in Jesus Christ, of the transformation of the hearts and the people, of, of, the, of the truth of the Word of God being shown to be true. And we want to hear a truth proclaimed. We want to celebrate it. We want to hear a truth sang. We want to worship with it. We want to see God heal. We want to celebrate. We don't need to get all fixated on all the problems. And now my gift's going to get out there. This is critical because some of our gifts are going to be used when wrongdoing occurs. Some of your gifts are going to happen, and mercy is going to come out, and leadership's going to be needed, and these things are going to happen. And so we don't rejoice that we get to. We get up, and out of our kindness, out of patience, out of love, we get over there, and we simply engage, and we celebrate the truth that God is bringing in this world. Now, 
obviously all these things begin to apply and we can begin to see how God is working because we want to be a church and that we get to be a church, not just go to church. We get to be a church when we use our gifts, but we're only the church when love guides the gifts. And so this is critical because the church is the most permanent thing in the world. And the reason why is because of the love of the church. You see, love, the way of love is powerful and permanent. It's powerfully permanent. It doesn't go away. And that's how he ends in this section. He finishes off verse 8, love never ends, right? He's always said, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Man, this love is gritty. It is just ready to hold on and not let go. It's going to bear up under all kinds of garbage. False, false prophecies, misuse of tongues, all kinds of um, bad prayers for people and hurt people. But we're going to endure. We're going to lift up. We're going to be with them. We're going to keep moving forward. We're going to trust God that He's working in all these people. It's going to trust. It's going to hope that God's eternal end is right and good because He's sovereign in control of His church. We don't have to freak out and get controlled and try to do these. We can stay humble with the gifts. We can use them for other people, even at our own expense. Man, we're going to endure through all the persecutions and garbage of this world. And as we do this, it's the gifts that enabled us to do this used in a loving fashion. See, these gifts used with love become how we bear together under all things, how we believe in God in all kinds of crazy situations, how we continue to hope for eternity, though poverty and other things may hit or we suffer through these things together. It's persevering. It's gritty. And it doesn't go away. The gifts will go away, but the love that guides it will never go away. And so we need to fixate on that. That's how Paul finishes it off. He says, love never ends. As for prophecies, they're going to pass away. As for tongues, they're going to cease. All right? For we know in part and we prophesy in part. Or so knowledge is going to pass away. We know in part, we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I misused the gifts like a child, right? But when I became a man, I grew up and I, you hear, I gave up childish ways. For now, we see in a mirror dimly. We don't get it all. We don't have a full knowledge. We're going to make mistakes and blow it up. But one day we're going to see God face to face. So I know, know in part, and then I shall know fully even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. You know, some people have used this passage in history to try to say there are no gifts anymore. They're all gone. In fact, they go back here and they say, look, when the perfect comes, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. Um, the problem with this idea is that the, when the perfect comes is when Christ returns. You see, love will continue on, but once the tabernacle is built, once Christ has come into His kingdom, once the kingdom is here, the gifts are done. We have built it. It's time now to enjoy one another in full-on love. God, we don't need to heal. We're all healed. We don't need tongues. We'll know and understand one another. We're not going to need revelation from God. We'll have God there. There is all of this beauty and opportunity, and so what remains is love. So why should we as a church fixate more on love than on the gifts? Because love lasts forever. We use the gifts. God will use the gifts as we love each other, as we serve each other. But if the gifts become the thing itself, then we've missed out on the point that it's about love. And it's about caring for one another. It's about being patient with each other. It's about being kind to one another. It's about not being self-focused, but other-focused. It's about this endurance and grittiness to care for one another. This is the beauty of what we have. And when we get to that in, in time, when we get to that last day, we're going to see that these gifts were temporary, that we don't need all the teaching and all the stuff anymore. We're going to celebrate together in the presence of God, and it's going to be incredible. And what we have then is still the self-sacrificial love of Christ and one another. And that will remain. And so the challenge here is as we come back, as we be the church, not just go to church, as we be the church, as you re-engage over these next few months, as you return from being at home in this COVID world, is to step in and be the church through letting love guide your gifts. How do you use the gifts? You use them with love. You use them in humility. You use them with hope. You use them in these ways that have been divined in this chapter. What you will see is that God then will work through us, far beyond us, and for His church. And I believe one day what will happen 
is that because we've been able to use these gifts, we'll be standing there and we'll realize how many more opportunities we missed. I think of the ending of Schindler's List, where the man, Mr. Schindler, is standing there and he's being greeted by all these people that were saved by him. And he's falling apart, bawling. He's thinking, this pen, this pen could have been one more person, this coat, this jacket. He saw all the opportunities missed and how many more people he could have saved. In the same way, when we are standing there on that last day and we see all the ways that we could have loved one another, all the ways you could have used your gift, I don't want you to miss out. I don't want you to have regret upon regret of all the chances you missed. No, let's not just go to church. Let's be the church. Take an opportunity to find out what those spiritual gifts are. Use them in love towards one another in the church, and let's be the church. And as you are challenged to do that, again, I want to encourage you, if you haven't yet, take in that spiritual gifts assessment, do so. You can do so online, you can do it on the app. But also, we're asking you, all of you who've been watching, all of you who've been involved, when you get that information, to let us know. We have a card here. We'd let, we'd love for you to inform us of what those gifts are so we can help you see where you fit in the body of Christ. So the hand can be a hand, an eye can be an eye. You can engage, even choose and pick out a ministry you'd like to engage with. There's a list of them there. And what that'll help you do is begin to be the church. And as you do it in love, I believe God is going to revolutionize what He's doing here at Olive Branch and in this valley and in the churches all around us because He is at work. And I trust that He is going to be at work through you, beyond you, and for the church. You see, let's get out there. Let's be the church by using our gifts. Let me pray over you all. God, I just pray that you would bless them as they are stepping towards this Easter season, as they are stepping towards this opportunity to return to church in person as COVID lifts and these things happen, as they become more comfortable. I pray that you would bless them. Let them see their gifts. Let them engage with those gifts. Let them be able to use them in such a mighty way through love as you guide us that your work in this world would grow that your gospel would go out, that we'd be able to love you more, that we'd be able to live for you more, that we would share you more, that you'd be known wherever we go. We thank you for this chance that you've given us to learn about these spiritual gifts. Help us to apply them in love and let us move forward from here in the name of Christ. Amen. My name is Chris Gilliatt. I'm Candace Gilliatt. <laughs> You're terrible. I'm going to take this. <laughs> Hi, we're Chris and Candace Gilead. Um, we've been attending Olive Branch for about 11 years now. So initially when this question was asked, um, I would say that I didn't feel like I had any spiritual gifts. Um, and upon looking more into what that is and how we have been able to spend time at the church, um, there's definitely a lot of things that I think we have been able to do for um, the church and to serve. So I know one time specifically, um, I work in education, there, every day is different. There's always a crisis, there's always something going on. I built up a relationship with this student and they felt like they could trust me and everything and they were telling me some things that were going on with them and then finally at one point she came to me and said that she was thinking about committing suicide. You know, and this was years ago, and, and since then, four or five years ago, I've been able to talk to her and her mom, and, and they're doing wonderful. But in, in the thick of it, you know, being someone that she felt that she could go to and, and helping guide her and her family through that situation was, um, I know God was, was involved in that whole situation. I would say that you're not alone in not knowing what your spiritual gifts are and really how to even begin to find them. The first step is just being brave and stepping out and saying yes. And there's gonna be things along the way that you find you're not really well suited for. Uh, and there's gonna be other things that are just totally your jam and it just clicks for you and you just know this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And it's, you got to test the waters a little bit in that. Um, know that if you've kind of got that sinking feeling in your stomach, that's okay, because a lot of people have that um, when being asked to do things, especially outside of their comfort zone. But also, just encourage you that this is God's design for us all to work together, and where one person is strong, another person uh, isn't necessarily. And we all come together 
to be able to form God's ultimate design. And if God does not want you there, then he is going to remove you from that situation because he's the one that's ultimately in control of how he wants to use you. You know, it just goes to show that you never know when God is going to call upon you to use your gifts. It could come as a surprise, you know. It could come in the sense that somebody else has seen your giftings in you and has told you that you have a gift that you're not confident yourself that you have. Trust the Lord. Like she said, take a step. You may feel uncomfortable. You may not feel prepared. But take that step and use those gifts that God has blessed you with. And if you're not sure what they are, you know, on one, we've got a simple tool online, a spiritual gift assessment. You can take that and let us know what your gifts are. We want to encourage you in those and help you to use them, all right? Again, thank you for joining us this week. Easter is coming this coming week. I want you to think now, who are you going to invite? Who are you going to invite to share the message with on Easter? Because it's going to be available on all of our normal platforms. But if you want to attend live and invite somebody to it, I want everybody to be aware as well. We are not doing Easter services on our main campus. It's going to be at our Trilogy property across the street from Tom's Farm. So it'll be open air so you know people will feel comfortable coming out. And, and as things are opening up, it's going to be a great opportunity to invite somebody and bring them to a very poignant and powerful message. Um, so again, we still need quite a few volunteers to serve on Easter Sunday, so let us know. Uh, we especially need them for the 11 o'clock service right now, but let us know if you can help and volunteer on Easter at any of our services, 6, 30, 9, or 11, we can use you. So just text EASTER to 951-382-5111, uh, let us know you're available, we'll contact you uh, and get you, get you serving, all right? And also don't forget, Great Good Friday is a powerful message that you want to invite people to come. Sign up online and be here Friday. We're doing 5 o'clock and 7 o'clock services, right? God bless you guys. Have a great day.